question. Um, first of all, welcome to all of you to CSIS um, and to this uh, session on, with um, Minister Okechu Enelamu, if I've said that correctly. I think he goes by OK. It's, yes. it's much easier, <laughs> much easier um, to talk about kind of the Nigeria's current trade and investment uh, landscape. Uh, some of the opportunities, how Nigeria perhaps is looking at the transition that's happened here in the United States. Um, uh, the minister has been Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment since November 2015. He has a very long career in the private sector, um, CEO of Africa Capital Alliance, which was a, a leading private equity firm, with uh, Zephyr in New York City with the South African uh, Growth Fund, uh, in Johannesburg, uh, he is he has a, he's a certified financial analyst, a certified uh, accountant. He has an MBA from Harvard. He's one of these Nigerians with lots of initials after his name, <laughs> <laughs> and actually studied medicine and surgery when he was an undergraduate. So you know you you guys put us all to shame uh, uh, in the in the credential side. Uh, he comes to office at a challenging time uh, for Nigeria uh, 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 with a monumental task uh, before him. You know, I think generally and well warranted, there's a lot of optimism about Nigeria, or there should be. Um, the size of the population, the growth trends, the, the rise of a, of a middle class, um, even the diversification that's happened over the recent years into telecommunications, into banking, uh, into construction, uh, technology, uh, the film industry, Nollywood, I've been told is the second largest employer. I still find it a little bit hard to, to uh, uh, believe that, but that's what I'm told. Um, and an economy that's grown significantly uh, it, over the past decade. Um, but it's in, and it's been in a couple of hard years. Uh, the fall of commodity prices, uh, the economy has diversified. Oil right now is just 14% of GDP, but it's still 70% of government revenues. So the fall in oil prices, uh, combined with renewed violence in the Niger Delta, uh, have really left, uh, have uh, really dented government revenues in an important way. Infrastructure rem remains problematic. Uh, that is in particularly in power. But uh, uh, I've been told a former Nigerian finance minister said that the second biggest uh, obstacle that investors see in Nigeria is in ports. And the, the, uh, the backups at ports. Uh, she, she said Nigeria has, is the only country in the world where the ports operate nine to five. Um, but uh, so important structural challenges uh, as well. It's still a complicated place to do business. You need kind of good partners on, on the ground uh, to kind of navigate your way. Um, and uh, uh, there are kind of multiple kind of centers of, of power and rules and the tiered system is, can be difficult as well. We are in a, mo uh, in a moment of transition here in Washington. Uh, where there's a lot of uncertainty about what U.S.-Africa policy might look like, uh, what uh, U.S. trade policy, broadly written, might look like. Um, so we're eager to hear a little bit about kind of how you're thinking about that. Uh, to my mind, it's very important to make the case to this administration that Africa matters and that Nigeria matters. Uh, Nigeria is more than a security challenge. There are uh, so, so many reasons for uh, par our partnership with Nigeria. <laughs> One, and I was saying this earlier, is, is I think uh, among countries in Africa, there's a, a similar kind of affinity and outlook uh, and entrepreneurial dynamism between the U.S. and, and Nigeria that the U.S. doesn't always see eye to eye with some of, uh, of our other strategic partners there. Um, so there's a strong case to be made that Nigeria uh, and robust engagement and broad multidimensional engagement is very important. And I think the trade and investment agenda uh, is, is a huge opportunity uh, for the U.S. government going forward. 
Uh, let me turn to the minister and we'll, we'll, you'll, I think, give us a brief overview. We'll engage and we'll take plenty of questions from the audience. So welcome and thanks for joining us. Thank you very much and thank you for having me. Um, let me make, with your kind permission, let me keep my comments brief and allow us to have a more interactive session, uh, particularly given that um, we now have to keep this appointment at the State Department at 4 p.m. and we need to leave at some point. But let me begin by saying that how honored and grateful and privileged we are to come to CIS. Um, I've had um, a bit of an opportunity by coming in early to learn about your rich history, the role you've played in our own country and you continue to play, and the many dots and um, um, points you connect. So we feel that we need relationships like this. And um, when we get the opportunity to come to places like this, we, we do value it and we don't take it for granted. Thank you very much. Um, let me make a few brief remarks just to set the tone for what I hope will be a lively and, and useful conversation. Uh, let me start by prefacing or, or sort of making the point that, you know, we are here to learn. I mean, in a time of this kind of significant transition, I think it would be a huge mistake to come with the idea that we know what the solutions are, or even what, you know, um, the state of play is. I mean, there is just such transition, fundamental transition going on that one has to uh, come with an open mind and frankly um, build on relationships, networks, and, and hope that this will continue to be relevant over time. So the first thing to say is that um, from the point of view of Nigeria, you know about the election. We had our own election in 2015 that ushered in a new government under the leadership of President Muhammad Buhari, who had a vision then and, and a vision now that was based on three pillars. The first pillar was on security and the importance of um, um, peace and security across the length and breadth of Nigeria. He may well be one of the important reasons why Nigerians voted for him because he comes from a military background in his previous career and felt that security ought to be given every attention because everything else flows from there. And so far, I would say we've made progress under his, um, under his leadership. The second pillar was on the, on the area of governance and fighting corruption. He had this um, phrase that if we don't kill corruption, corruption may well kill us, and therefore that we ought to take it very seriously. And he brought a level of personal credibility because he had had a long track record in public service where he could have um, <clears throat> misappropriated all kinds of funds and simply didn't. So Nigerians chose to trust him, and even up till today, I would argue that that's still one of the most important assets of the government and of um, President Buhari himself, the fact that his own personal integrity and personal example. <coughs> But importantly, we are also looking to fight um, or, or to pursue the war against corruption in a very institutional way, and I'll tell you what we're doing about that. And then, of course, the third pillar was on the economy, the importance of diversifying the economy in the face of the, the, the sort of um, crash of um, the commodity prices, as well as the you know, changes in global trade and global um, economic um, shifts that meant that we just... Uh, weren't um, in the same position we were previously. And that, in some respects, gave us the opportunity to pursue something we've always talked about, which is how to diversify not just the economy, but government revenues and even government foreign exchange or the country's foreign exchange earnings and foreign exchange supply. Now, against that backdrop, fast forward to where we are today. Um, we've made a lot of progress, but one of the most important um, things going on right now is that we've just come up with a new plan and when I call it a new plan, it's a new plan in terms of pulling everything we're doing together called the Nigeria Economic Recovery and Growth Plan. And the purpose of this plan is to articulate in a very clear way for people, for all the stakeholders, what our policy interventions and policy direction um, will be going forward in a way that people could understand it and work with it. Because we kept getting the feedback, well, we, we, we are not sure what you're doing. We're not sure what the policies of this government is. You know, and so we thought it was important both for the things we are doing and the things we intended to do going forward to bring them together in this economic recovery and growth plan. And just to give you a flavor for the plan, the plan has three very um, high level priorities amongst many others, but the, the three most important we've decided are one, food and an agribusiness, you know, trying to make sure we pursue the advantage we have there to a logical conclusion to make sure we become not just sufficient in our own food production, but become very competitive and export-oriented as well. 
Two is around the whole area of infrastructure, particularly power and energy and um, petrol, you know, the petroleum industry to make sure that we become more efficient and get the results we need there to power the rest of the economy. And third is the whole theme of industrialization in a way that would lead us to achieve our economic diversification goals, aspirations, as well as, <coughs> excuse me, as well as, you know, create the kind of jobs that are needed to keep our people um, gainfully employed and so on. Now, in the midst of all this, let me also say that um, what's important is that, like, um, just to bring it to the level of the ministry that I oversee, which is the Ministry of Industry, Trade and Investment, a lot of the policy directions we had already are very consistent with this um, policy direction or this plan of the government. Uh, we took the view from the very beginning that the most important thing was to focus on creating the right enabling environment <coughs> for industry, trade and investment to happen. As many of you would know, enabling environment is a very, um, is, you know, is a very, um, um, you know, it's a very pervasive concept. It's a theme that you could relate to infrastructure, you could relate to policy, you could relate to competitiveness. You certainly can relate it to, you know, the very basic attractiveness of your environment for doing business, for attracting investments, and, 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 and for competitiveness in terms of lowering the cost of doing business. So we think it's a very important strategic initiative for the government. Fortunately, this is a, a view that is shared at all levels of government. The president um, loves the idea and has endorsed it and uh, has launched a presidential council to oversee wide-ranging um, reforms to implement uh, the key initiatives we have in terms of this ease of doing business and, and creating the right enabling environment. That council, by the way, is chaired by the vice president and has all the key ministers and agencies of government working with it and reporting to it. <coughs> It's also importantly working, we're also working with the private sector in terms of implementation. And it's something, and it's attracted a lot of um, you know, um, good interest, very solid interest, and we're well on our way to implementation. This is something I'm very, very happy about. Um, the other policy thrust of our ministry is to pursue a strategy we have on industrial policy and industrialization that has been there for some time. A, a policy called the Nigeria Industrial Revolution Plan. We really would like to, and, and it's a very good plan on paper. People will tell you that at times we don't lack good plans. It's actually implementation that has been some of the issues we've faced. So I would say by far our biggest priority is to work in a way to achieve reasonable implementation of this plan within the life of this administration. Bearing in mind that industrialization is a multi-year, I would even argue, generational concept. You know, somebody has said it takes at least one generation to rebuild the nation, and in terms of the economy and even the culture, you know, and we believe that like, um, there's a great African proverb that says, whenever you wake up, it's your own morning. So once you wake up, you start pursuing your day. You know, you, you just get on with it, rather than pursuing a life of regret or talking about what you could have done, should have done. So our view is that that industrialization plan needs to be pursued with vigor, with rigor, with commitment, and that's what we're doing. And of course, it cannot be done without the private sector. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're very keen to make sure we work with the private sector to implement the plan in a very systematic and a very robust way. One of the things we're launching is an industrial council that will have a very, um, very senior representation from the private sector, from the government, to oversee the work of this industrialization agenda of government. And we've received, again, very good support for this industrial, industrial council. Um, the other part that is um, of increasing interest to us is the whole area of the digital economy. Uh, there's a plan we're implementing around a smart digital economy project or initiative that is basically around what are those things government should be doing to support the private sector, which is already doing very, very well in terms of telecoms, ICT, in terms of um, um, access to data, and uh, in terms of just what our people are doing to participate in the global digital economy, e-commerce, and so on. Even the talk about Nollywood, to some degree, uh, fits into that in the sense that the next logical extension of Nollywood is to leverage technology to get it you know, further and uh, further and, 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 and to make it more, you know, to pervade uh, not just our society but the, the global marketplace. And all these things are happening with very little support from the government. Mm -hmm. uh, the one thing we did right was we privatized the um, telecom sector mm -hmm. and it, it unleashed a telecom revolution that is still um, arguably one of Nigeria's most successful and important reforms 
in the last 10 to 15 years. And there are important lessons to learn from that, which is why we have taken the view as a government that this partnering with private sector for development has to be more than rhetoric. It has to be the engine that will drive our economic agenda. You know, and um, the, the, the final thing I want to talk about is the relationship with the US. Um, we, we, our view is that um, despite the changes, the transition, it's good to remind ourselves that this is a very strategic and a very important relationship. And the early feelers we're getting may well be that we may even have stronger, more strategic, more core relationship with the Trump government than we had with the Obama government without taking away anything from all the very good initiatives that President Obama could pursue. But if you look at Nigeria as a country and our standing in Africa and the feedback we're getting from the, the feedback admittedly from the US, they seem to understand better that Nigeria is just very strategic to Africa. Yeah. I think Nigeria was treated as one more important country under President right. Obama. Right. Here, I understand that we may well be considered well. For instance, the President um, Trump had a very useful call with our president yesterday, and I understand it was the first one. And certainly, that's the feelers we're getting. And we want to grab it with both hands, because we think it's good for the US, it's good for Nigeria. We certainly believe that it helps Nigeria to provide the kind of leadership issue to Africa. We certainly do take it as meaning more responsibility to whom much is given more to whom uh, much is given, much is expected, and we, we accept that responsibility. The relationship between U.S. Um, corporations and Nigeria run very deep, and they've been there for a very long time. The relationship between civil society in the U.S. and Nigeria um, has also been there for a very long time. Even the role you played leading up to the election is just one example. So we believe that there's a lot of opportunity for collaboration, for partnership, and for working together for our mutual benefit. And you certainly have the kind of government. I schooled in the U.S., worked in the U.S. So you have people like me, and I'm, uh, it's not a unique experience. Exactly. I mean, many people in the government exactly. share that experience. So we think it creates a very important opportunity to work with you all to maximize um, and realize our potential on both sides and, frankly, turn some of the rhetoric into purposeful action in the areas of self-interest, you know, which inevitably comes back to good win-win partnership. Right. That's, what they, that's what history teaches, that's what life teaches, that's what even marriage teaches. So I hope that's <laughs> where we're going to end up uh, on both sides. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, that was great, succinct, um, but like a lot of good ideas within there and, and, and thoughts. Um, and you have, uh, for our Secretary of State, is very familiar, Rex Tillerson is very Absolutely. familiar with Nigeria, and that's, that's a boon, and, mm -hmm. and I think... Uh, uh, there's a lot of goodwill from the U.S. side. I have a, maybe a couple of questions. Uh, the first is, you know, Nigeria is a big place, and it's a place almost of multiple economies. And we, you know, the the much of the dynamism of the uh, of the economies in the south and the southwest, you know, the Lagos Ibadan corridor. Um, They've done very well from globalization and interconnectedness. But I would say that the North and the manufacturing base and the textiles in the North have suffered over time from globalization. Uh, being, and I, I, you know, there's, so there's kind of competing uh, needs or context there. Um, is, is kind of one question. How do you balance that? And the second, and I say this kind of from a political economy and maybe even a security aspect and national cohesion, how do you link that southern economy with the northern economy uh, and creating kind of links of interdependence? I know there's some interesting things in, in the fertilizer industry, for example, using natural gas or fertilizer extension up to the north. But I wonder how you see addressing those very regional uh, differences in, in the economy. And then how do, do you kind of give a leg up to some of those that are less well endowed uh, in resources? It's a very good question. And I would, um, I would share just a few thoughts, even though it's a topic we could spend a long time talking about, because I think it's a fascinating subject for nation building and for how you achieve, I would say, effective um, an effective um, market economy, mm -hmm. an effective industrialization, an effective, because you know, people talk about global value chains, regional value chains, but for countries that are large, like Nigeria, it starts actually with intra country value chains, yeah. right? Because if you look at the complementarity between the North and the South, it's extremely compelling, very compelling. And the reason why we haven't tapped it and why we need to tap it is that if you don't tap it, 
I mean, it's like saying charity begins at home. It's just, it's, just, it's just like an empty wagon making noise. The reason you haven't tapped it is also relevant for tapping regional value chains and global value chains. And in one word, is infrastructure. You know, somebody talks about the Golden Triangle, and it's about the railway lines. And it's about, you know, basically the, the ability to move goods and services across a reasonably large country. If you're not doing that and you think you can just show up in the world and the world will give you where, I think you're being extremely naive which is why the president believes that in terms of infrastructure, we must link all the key regions and markets of Nigeria and, and peoples of Nigeria for that matter. So uh, this whole railway reconstruction, which is a major, major infrastructure initiative, admittedly we're working more with China because they provided the funding mm -hmm. and have sh and showed the most appetite for working. And it's a multi-billion dollar initiative. It's crucial mm -hmm. for addressing this question. That's point number one. Point number two is that um, there is a lot of historic ties between them. And the truth is that while we talk about the things that divide us, we need to be very aware that these are, you know, these are, uh, how do I say this now? A lot of it is serves particular interests of particular groups, maybe politicians. You know, when you want an election, some people may emphasize religion or ethnicity or any number of other factors, depending on where they think the votes will come from, as happens in the US. But we shouldn't underestimate the level of historical ties. So. North has historically been the food basket of Nigeria, and still is. It's just that it's been very inefficient. And in fact, um, I'm part of a council or a task force of the cabinet working on food prices and food security yeah, because yeah, we yeah. find that the cost of transporting food, somebody give an example of buying two bars of yam from the north. Um, if, you, if you want to buy it in Lagos, it's like something like six times, no, sorry, four to six times the price, just because by the time it's transported, the price has you know, and all that. So that's, those like, are the kind of things. Like you're still buying Vietnamese rice, for example. Uh, you know, just because, and, and, and just lastly, by way of example, there was a very um, good constructive engagement between the state of Lagos, which is in the southwest, mm -hmm. and KB, which is in the north, on rice, oh. right? Mm -hmm. Something called lake rice, you know, Lagos and KB. And it just sends such a strong positive signal because working together, rice that was cultivated in the north you know, um, and, and, and distributed in, in Lagos, you know, reduced the price of rice dramatically over Christmas and created a lot of political goodwill. It's, and it's just one example right. of what is possible. And I can tell you that there's a lot of um, work going into that. And we certainly believe it's one of the areas where being one government mm -hmm. at the center can help in working with sub-regional government or state governments. Um, so it's a very interesting yeah. subject yeah. and it's one that we're paying a lot of attention to. Um, there was a second question on uh, well, that was uh, well the pr uh, protection versus openness uh, yes. because there are different needs within the economy. But y you answered to a certain extent. Okay. If you want to say more, that's uh, fine. Well, let's go on then. Uh, okay. Um, a, a, a second question, maybe you know, where to a U.S. investment audience? Where do you think the big, the next big opportunities uh, for investment are? I'm well, not an investment person, so I don't know if that's... I think, I think there are a couple of ways of looking at that. One way to look at it is look at where we view our future. And the good news is that a lot of it is directly relevant to the U.S. Like I told you, this is our economic um, recovery and growth plan. <clears throat> we did it and we had a number of priorities, maybe 12 priorities. I would say 12 priorities are too many. If we had to do three things well that will guarantee the success of this plan and invest in our people and get us the results, what would they be? And after a lot of brainstorming and back and forth, we came to the conclusion that they will have to revolve around food and agribusiness, mm -hmm. agriculture and agribusiness, power and infrastructure and petroleum sector, and industrialization. Mm -hmm. And if you look at all three, you know, the relationship with the U.S. Um, will be very relevant. Uh, if you look at agribusiness and what we're doing, I mean, a lot of it is um, an area where the U.S. has done very well and where we have U.S. companies that are very in interested, whether it's in terms of a supply chain, we met with Dow Chemicals earlier today. We met with a U.S. Um, business that is very active in Nigeria in terms of um, um, flour and agribusiness right, earlier yeah. today as well. So, the, so, the, 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 so there are so many areas where, 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 we, are, where we have um, a lot of... Um, the same is true of power, not just at the Power Africa initiative, but in terms of U.S. companies. Mm -hmm. One of the better examples being General Electric that is working very actively in the country with us to just provide that infrastructure in a very tangible way of you know, just um, taking part in real life projects, real projects that will make a difference. And the same thing can be said of industrialization and industrial companies that are interested, that are global companies. Many of our top um, investors in terms of industrial companies in, in Nigeria are 
US companies like Procter and Gamble, Coca-Cola, and you name the rest. Mm -hmm. um, so my point is that um, we, we see a lot of opportunity there. But I also add the digital economy, mm -hmm. where the US is clearly a market leader, and where Nigeria is maybe a follower, but a very entrepreneurial, yes. innovative follower, which is why it's caught the attention of the US icons and big players. I mean, Mark Zuckerberg has been there. Google is doing a lot there. Mm -hmm. And we think that um, there's a lot of interesting initiatives and synergies that are going on. So our view is that like, a lot of this will happen at the private sector level, at the you know, individual corporate level, but the government has a role to play to keep working on the enabling environment. And certainly meetings like this and engagements like this are useful because I think the fact that we have um, a very strategic and a very positive relationship is not only reassuring for the investors and the, and the players, but also could help us in creating this enabling environment, which, by the way, the U.S. government was working with us on, and we believe the new government will also work with us on going forward. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Uh, yes, let's take some questions. I have a bunch more, but I'm not going to monopolize you. Uh, Tony Carroll, who's a senior associate here. <coughs> Thank you, Minister. In 19, or 2001, or 2000, 2001, I was uh, hired by the World Bank to undertake a study on prospects for industrialization or economic growth in the non-petroleum sector. And we did a survey, a large survey of industry, of businesses in Nigeria, and we were all expecting a lot of um, you know, complaints about business environment, you know, corruption, inability to enforce contracts, and time and again the biggest complaint was the absence of power. Uh, as Dr. Lepin has reminded me, uh, there's been actually a decline in power capacity in the last 10 years in Nigeria. Uh, and secondly, um, what is so befuddling about unleashing foreign investment to the power sector? Is it a pricing issue? You've unraveled NEPA, you've created regional uh, solutions which doesn't, don't, do not seem to have worked. And what is so confounding? Is it a pricing issue? Is it an institutional capacity issue? Um, because we're not making much progress. And for you to grow your industrialization vision, you're going to have to have more reliable power at more competitive prices. And then related to that, and I'll pass this on, is, is the confounding issues with the, with the Naira. To what extent will the Naira be allowed to float at its true value, which may create opportunities for export, growing your export economy, which right now seem to be not so much just the level of the pricing, but the uncertainty of the pricing of the Naira has given people much pause in terms of being more ambitious. And I, and I say this because recently having had a discussion on this very issue with this former CEO of ShopRite and some of the issues that they're wrestling with in terms of Naira valuation. It's the uncertainty of the Naira and their ability of being able to manage their value chains in Nigeria with the uncertainty of the Naira that's causing them to be, um, shall we say, cautious about doing more. I know those aren't particularly favorable questions, but I thought you'd... Uh, do, do you feel like you want to collect a few? Well, or? he asked okay. like three That's, questions. That is so let me, three let me, questions, let me, let me yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and they're excellent questions. I think the first question around enabling environment, um, if you don't mind my putting that way versus power, is clearly one that needs to be redirected to enabling environment and power. There's this expression, the power of and. And the reason is that the two questions are inextricably related. A lot of the reason why you haven't seen the results on power has to do with governance. And the way to address governance issues institutionally and create the right incentives for large infrastructure projects to go on is enabling environment and fighting corruption institutionally. So that that way you have transparency, you have you know, better procurement and the good, all, those, all that good stuff. And the thing about enabling environment is that once, if you have political will and you have sincerity and commitment to dealing with it, it's actually not academic at all. I think you will find that like, it may well be the singular most important legacy of the Buhari government because he happens to be somebody that brings both personal example and a level of commitment to fighting corruption that I think we must not miss as an opportunity. And I certainly feel like I have a particular responsibility coming from the private sector to entrench those good practices in government in a way that will be sustainable. Having said that, you are right that power is a stubborn problem. I remember talking to an economist many years ago I was, when I was in the private sector, I went to this conference and I you know, kind of very loosely said, oh, we, we think our number one priority is power and we're working on it. He just told me, be very careful now, that power has flawed a lot of people. A lot of people have tried to solve the power problem. And he was talking about African countries in general and if you don't go about it the right way, you may not get the results. You may spend the money and like you said, not get the results. 
And you are right that Nigeria has, to some degree, many missed opportunities in addressing the power problem. And we hope we can learn from those lessons and move forward. Take, for instance, the last uh, privatization that was done. The missed opportunity there, comparing to telecoms, was that the process was done in a way that ended up not attracting enough of the international players with their capacity, with their funding. And it ended up being a local, sort of like entrepreneurial exercise, which clearly power is not. Power is a global infrastructure, big money, you know, big players' business. And any process that excludes them has to be accepted as flawed, even if, if the intentions were very noble. And so we need to correct that. And, and that's what we're doing, to say what is the most um, appropriate way to bring these global players who are still interested back in without unraveling on doing what you've done already? What is the best way to address the, the, the value chain problems in power, you know, between generation to transmission to distribution? Uh, what is the best way to address the liquidity constraints in the system today, depending on who you talk to and what uh, part of the value chain they're in? They're talking about different problems, but it's like touching an elephant, you know? It's the same elephant, but you're feeling different parts of it. <laughs> and so my view is that like, we must wrestle it down, and the key to doing it is to go back to this fundamental um, partnership with the private sector. Um, you know, this is actually where globalization works. You see, uh, and I don't want, I'm not, a, I'm not a sort of a scholar like CSIS and all that, but I Wait, understand a few I'm things. I haven't been in business <laughs> for many, many years. The, the benefits of globalization lie in scale and in using the things that have worked to work for you. The cost of power is coming down rapidly and geometrically so. And we need to set that stage and allow that power, you know, the money to flow in while reducing the cost of production and the cost of delivery of power to the consumers. And I believe that's what we're doing. You know, it will take some shake-up. Yeah, it will take some, some, some new investors coming in and new initiatives. And the government will have to carry part of that cost, frankly, because there's some dead cost in there that is like a sunk cost, and no investor is going to accept it. So that's what we're working through. On my way back, I'm going to stop in London. I'm having meetings with some of the power players that are there. So there's a lot of work that is going on there already. And um, I know you had a last question on currency. currency yeah. yeah. Uh, on currency, it's, it's a classic example of where we, um, I would argue, we are slow to recognize, you know, why we needed to get ahead of the problem. So we tended to be reacting initially as if the problem would just go away, you know, and, and it didn't. But at the middle of last year, we eventually come, came up with policy. And when I say we, I'm using it loosely because, as you know, the central bank is so for monetary policy and, frankly, had to come up with the policies, at least the way our system works. And they eventually, and there was a lot of debate around there, I can tell you, amongst the economic team in government, but eventually there's enough acceptance that we, want, we prefer a market solution that will increase supply. This was what they called originally demand management, which was the theme you kept hearing, which is literally 41 items. You know, basically trying to constrain the demand on the foreign exchange. It's on the surface, it made sense because we had less. So you say we should demand less. But as you know, markets don't quite work that way. So eventually we had decided to pursue from a supply side which meant um, a different set of um, policies. And then they came up with these policies, which were the right policies, by the way, in my view, middle of last year. But the implementation was such that it was, again, tentative. And so one of the things we are doing now is to make sure the implementation is better. Thankfully, also, the supply even from the government is beginning to come back because of a, all your revenues inching up and production coming back. But I believe that the real solution will come from bringing the private sector players back into the supply because many of them dried up, foreign direct investors, portfolio investors, um, even diaspora investors and so on, or, or, or contributors. So I think um, it's gotten a lot of attention, but there, there are some good signs right now. You know, we did your Euro bond offering, eight times oversubscribed. Yeah, yeah. It's all about market confidence. You know, as you know, markets are notoriously fickle. Once confidence is not there, people just run, and that's why there's a lot of momentum to markets, and that's what we saw in Nigeria. They, they just, the they dollar just dried up. And so now it's coming back. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, let's take a few with a lady here. <coughs> Wait for the mic and please identify yourself. Thanks. Mr. Minister, thank you for coming. Um, I'm Francis Cook. I uh, want to start by agreeing with our chairman that Nigeria matters. It matters a great deal. And I think it's really important that you come here as a senior Nigerian official at the beginning of a new administration. Um, I uh, served many places in Africa and used to be head of West Africa and uh, have been to Nigeria multiple times, but not recently. 
And more recently, I've been in the private sector on corporate boards and chairing some boards in London, for example, Lonro. When I was chairman of Lonro, was my last trip to Lagos, where we launched the chapter of women corporate directors for Nigeria. <laughs> I came away feeling if women could run Nigeria for about five years, it would be in very good shape. But that's not my question. My question has to do with the three issues that have always come up when companies on whose boards I've served have wanted to invest in Nigeria. One is corruption, which your uh, government has uh, addressed mightily. The other issue is political stability. Uh, and the third issue now, which is new, and it's true in all the oil countries after s s many years of low oil prices, is the availability of capital to the government. So I have two questions that sort of join my two lives. <coughs> One is, um, I'd like an update on how you're doing with the IMF. I saw the sad news about the demise of Arik Airlines yesterday in the FT, uh, which uh, is a problem. I've flown on it, I used to like it a lot. So there's obviously still some capital issues and I don't know how your talks are going with the IMF and what's happening in that area. The other one is the political stability issue, and that's harder for me because I haven't been to Nigeria for three years. But I've heard, for example, that President Buhari still hasn't visited Lagos uh, because of security concerns. I've heard about what the Nigerian Senate has done with a lot of his nominees. Uh, we understand the problems uh, any head of state has with the Congress after the last eight years in this town, I assure you. But I'd like an um, understanding of how it's working in Nigeria now under the Buhari administration. So it's really political stability and capital available uh, to the government to do all these things that you want, um, uh, are interested in getting foreign companies to come in and work with you on. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Should we take another? Yeah. Or, um, well, let me answer or, that. Okay. Um, uh, let Guess me start with the second question. question. Let me start with the second question first. Um, <clears throat> on political stability, depending on how you look at it, many people will argue that that's actually in a SWOT analysis setting. That's one of the strengths of Nigeria. And I'll tell you why. It's not just loose thinking. First is, in terms of the political transitions we've had and the political sort of, um, uh, you know, this new dispensation in terms of the democracy that's started in 1999, it's gone better than expected. We've had, you know, a change from one government to the next. People were predicting it wouldn't go so well in 2015, and it went better than expected. Uh, we have a very robust um, fought estate in the media, extremely critical of government. In fact, on a lighter note, when this government was in opposition, they thought the media, we thought the media were their friends because they helped them get into power. At the moment they got into power, the media thought on them. And now <laughs> they're now with the opposition. So clearly, you have a very robust media and so on and so forth. And you have, you know, a very, and then of course you have robust opposition parties as well. So all the things are there and, and certainly I would and um, and, and, in, and the, um, despite all that you still have political stability in the sense of like it's certainly not true that the president didn't go to Lagos because of uh, security. Quite to the contrary, Lagos is one of the most secure parts of Nigeria and one of the issues is that like for a whole country that was asked earlier, the northeast, you couldn't say well because it's not happening in my neck of the woods it doesn't matter. Even if it's a few local governments in the northeast it's still part of you know the country and therefore in there to be addressed in a very comprehensive way, which is what this president argued and did for. But I would say the president is not under any threat whatsoever. And then the issue of National Assembly and all those things, it's, it's politics of opposition, because National Assembly is clear, trying to assert its independence, which you saw here under President Obama. So I don't think, I think that's actually a sign of a robust democracy. On the issue of capital and adequacy of capital and IMF, um, the view of Nigeria is basically that the reforms that we need to do, uh, we understand them, and it's very important that we're doing them because it's good for Nigeria and it's led by Nigeria. Because Nigeria has, as you know, Nigeria is quite asset rich and is, is, is a low indebted country by most uh, measures. So it's not an IMF issue unless you don't have political will. We don't need IMF to come and sort of tell us what to do, give you, you know, like under some program. And it's very important that we send a strong signal that we as Nigerians, are implementing the reforms that are good for Nigeria. Because in Nigeria, IMF, as you can imagine, has a bad name. I mean, IMF is coming off this Washington consensus, you know, one formula fits all. Very, very discredited, as you know. And so, in many respects, while IMF has transformed, many nations have been slow to understand. And it has a terrific leader in, in the current CEO, who you and I know is one of the most articulate and effective leaders IMF has had. And she's been to Nigeria quite a few times. And, uh, and we respect her a great deal. 
But still, I would say from a Nigerian positioning standpoint, it's important. You may have read in the press, for instance, that we're looking at options like should we sell some of our state assets? We're very asset rich in oil and gas field areas, you know, and just fund our economy and pursue the reforms. I don't think IMF can come up with better reforms that will be embraced by the private sector than the ones who come up with. First, will come from there. Uh, we understand it, and IMF likes the policies we're pursuing. The area they have a concern is the typical sort of currency, you know, and deregulation, and so on and so forth. So I think we'll end up certainly working with the World Bank and the multilateral institutions, but we don't think we need an IMF program. And I honestly believe that, like, that position is not necessarily the wrong one. I think the most important thing is to implement what you said you would do. Oh, okay. Uh, yes, it's a gentleman. Hello, Minister. Good afternoon. My name is Emmanuel Sucha from Verdaniel and Company. And I hate to go back to the power um, conversation. We were working with, um, sorry about that. I promise I didn't do it. <laughs> but we were working um, on advising a couple of private sector investors that were interested in the... Oh, sorry. They were yep. interested in the power sector in Nigeria. And one of the biggest complaints that they've had had been, I think, it's with the speakers yeah. around mm -hmm. um, The biggest complaint they've had is with the, um, the, the, the funding of the off-taker in terms of the power distribution. So the, when the um, discos are getting um, the power and giving it to the government to distribute to the, um, to the general populace. Um, they've had complaints that folks that already have co uh, contracts with the government aren't getting paid, um, that the foreign exchange issue came into place, as well as um, the, the, the government agency not being funded well enough. So the question becomes, and you sort of talked about some of the issues already, how are the reforms in that sector going in that specific area or the specific agency? And um, when should investors expect there to be um, solutions that can help them better um, assess the investments in terms of the sector? Thank you. So, like I said, on power, <clears throat> there are a number of issues we're dealing with on power. I mean, just to address your part, there's a tariff issue. We're just making the tariffs to be market um, based in a way that people feel they are recovering the cost of investment. There's a liquidity issue, which has to do with money flowing back from the discos. You know, it's a chain all the way to the generation companies that are the, are the, uh, in the upstream end of the chain. And then, of course, there is the whole um, gas to power issue, which has to do with the supply. Um, and all those issues are receiving attention. However, we want to do it in a way that is um, sustainable and uh, involves the private sector. Um, I don't want to get um, you know, too specific, but let me just say that like, whatever solution we come up with, we'll have to address, you know, for it to be sustainable, it has to be a market solution that addresses the tariff issue, brings more capital in in addressing that, and then creates the liquidity backlog that is clogging the system right now. And we're looking at that. Well, it's happening right now, so it's like time zero. It's not T1 or T2 or T3, it's T0. Okay, let's take the gentleman there in the bow tie and then the gentleman there. Um. Hello, Minister, thank you. Uh, my name is Ola Kula, I'm with ACI Boca. I have one question, agriculture in three parts. Uh, I think the numbers, so 50 to 60, the current uh, price of oil, uh, dollars per barrel, 120 million uh, <coughs> number of Nigerians who depend on agriculture for a significant part of their income, 9 billion, the estimated population of the world by 2050, and an expectation that Nigeria is probably the single only country that has the capacity to respond to that broken demand as measured by the difference between potential, uh, actual and, and potential. That surplus is not going to like to come from Sudan. And then 25 to 35 million rural voters. There's lots of people in the US who have suddenly realized that ignoring the power of the rural voter has significant consequences. Uh, and as a result of that, I think Nigeria's agricultural policies have always been focused on that very, very small. They're probably subcommonly viable. 
responded. And I'd like to get a sense from you on, as a part of the diverse, agricultural diversification policy, what is Nigeria doing to be able to fo shift focus on more commercial, viable agricultural uh, systems, value chains, commodity chains, uh, actors, while taking into consideration the power of that uh, rural vote. And this second part, uh, <coughs> at $60 a barrel, uh, diversification makes a lot of sense. Is there a price of oil at which diversification will sort of no longer sort of pique the Nigerian government's uh, interest? And okay. The third part was, <laughs> what are you going to do to curb inflation, which is driving high interest rates? But okay. I'm, I'm supposed to paraphrase these questions, so that's going to be a little difficult for me. The first was on um, moving or, or from kind of small holder yeah, to, commercial to commercial scale. The second, um, gosh, I don't know how you. The, the uh, second was, uh, at what price does oil cease? Yes. Uh, you know, how long is the diversification of your oil goes back up? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. And then the, the third is inflation, which then also affects food prices, which could be a big issue this coming year. Yes. Um, yeah, so let me deal with them one by one. On the agri question, like I said earlier, there are some cases where you can't afford the luxury of either or. Rather, what you need is more an ecosystem. And, I'm, and this is a well tested model where whether they are out growers or small growers, work with larger commercial farmers in a way that actually solves both problems. The employment problem, the efficiency problem or productivity problem of making sure those farmers get the inputs they need, seeds that are productive, inputs in terms of fertilizer and chemicals, inputs in terms of financing. I mean, these are models that have worked elsewhere. And the more you use the private sector to do it, the commercial farmers, and, and, and the, the better. Because right now, frankly, we're using more government to do it, and we know that we need to transition into more, more a private sector-led type of initiative. And one way to do that is to encourage the commercial farmers to come in, and they take over that responsibility from you. Otherwise, you then end up in this either-or trap that you have so aptly described. And that work is ongoing. There's an understanding that we need the commercial large-scale farmers working with also the commercial, you know, the, the smaller retailers and smaller players in a way that creates an ecosystem that is viable. And that's what we're pursuing as a strategy. On the issue of oil, you're absolutely right that um, the reason why we always make the contrarian point that um, a crisis is too great an opportunity to waste the low oil price gives us an opportunity for reform is exactly that point. That if, if you have the money and you're doing it just as a moral thing, but you don't need to, it's a lot harder than when you're boxed in, when you have no alternative. And that's why we are racing as Nigeria to say, even if all your prices are going to come down, I certainly think we have a major responsibility to get this our diversification agenda going in a very major way and to make sure that, um, fortunately, the gap we're dealing with, whether it's in terms of infrastructure, in terms of funding, is so wide that even that all your prices have recovered from their historic lows to 50s, we still are dealing with um, a funding gap for which, and I, and I wasn't being glib when I said we recognize this problem. Uh, I speak for myself as an individual, and I speak for this government. That, like, um, I believe we have the level of discipline to drive our agenda through. And if we don't, our country is in big trouble. Because, I mean, IMF won't do it for you. If a man doesn't have political will, and I don't want to philosophize here, and he thinks that IMF will come and solve it, but he's extremely naive, it won't happen. It just won't. So you need to drive that agenda that will engage your people, that will go beyond the oil cost and the oil dependency, and solve this problem which connects corruption with inefficiency, with poverty. I mean, it's such a huge problem. And that's really what we think this agenda is about, which is why we're looking at systemic um, institutional solutions, like changing government reforms, you know, governance, and, and as well as um, you know, industrialization policies that, that will work on infrastructure. I think, I think they're about inflation. You know, I'm not an economist in a classic sense, but I would say the best way to address it, inflation is to use supply-side economics. In, in other words, just to keep improving supply and the conditions that improve supply. Um, otherwise, you'll struggle with it. And our view right now is that like, um, the inflation we're dealing with is because of the scarcity that came out of, you know, whether it's foreign exchange, imported inflation, or inflation coming through um, the consequences of the recession and 
instead of, um, you know, the demand hasn't got away at a time when production just, you know, just um, contracted sharply. You know, so my view, which may be a layman's view, is that it's about supply. And I tell people, if we, when I got into government, I told them, but I, I mean, I said, um, I will focus on supply. I'm a great believer that supply will solve a lot of the problems. That even in a contrarian way, when you increase supply, you find that like the prices will start coming down. This is true of furniture, this is true of fuel, this is true of power. Just work on supply and do it in a way that let the market complain that like you're going to depress our prices. That's a better place to be as a government. And I'll use the instruments of government to increase supply as a regulator, as a government um, policy maker. I think we have a time for a couple more. The gentleman with the pink tie, yes. <coughs> Yes, yeah, so very good question. Let me deal with it very quickly on, you know, from two angles. One angle is basically that um, a lot of the institutional reforms, particularly around this enabling and business environment forum or secretariat and council, as well as um, <clears throat> many of the other ease of doing business initiatives need to be, you're yeah, right, not just federal, but at the sub-regional, I mean at the state and local government level. Uh, we have this National Economic Council, which is where the state governors meet with the Vice President chairs it, but with the federal um, sort of um, government to, to talk about how you run the country and how you deal with the things you have in common. And the good news is that they've embraced this work on enabling environment initiative, and some of the leading states actually want to work with us on it, and we are working on even to the level of the World Bank has this um, ease of doing business competition among states and other initiatives which we are working on. But I think those institutional reforms, you're right, must go down to the states. And they go down by working with the leadership of the states. The second principle is also that the consequence management in terms of judiciary and, um, and uh, people you know, facing consequences shouldn't just be a federal thing, which is why the court system goes all the way down. And again, that is one, 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 um, one way to deal with it. But I would say the final thing is let's even start from where you have control over. Because a lot of the issues that are at the federal level, if we address them, I'm sure that they will also filter down. So I would say that it's um, lead by example, work with the states, and make sure that like the judiciary, as you clean it up, that it's not just a federal thing, but it happens at the high courts and at the state courts and so on as well. We are just about at time. Uh, uh, <laughs> the gentleman, Manny. I'm sorry to those I can't, and, and we'll make the question quick and the answer yes, quick. I'll make it quick. Uh, in 
is called, uh, may not be enough to pay, I mean, civil servants, some, some states have not paid for six, seven months, and some uh, retirees have not been paid. Uh, quite home, about 27 of them died waiting for the money, uh, the retirement money. So if the states can find means by which they can get a raise and uh, 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 support themselves, they could more have which would create uh, employment opportunities and also increase their uh, bargaining power. Thank you. Uh, so very quickly, let me say that that's a very important um, and topical issue that we're dealing with right now, which is the viability of states and the subnational governments. Um, there's a part of it that is um, that is sort of structural, where you know some states are more viable than others. Uh, but there's no question that you've hit the nail on the head that the states have to be more efficient in terms of cost management and more efficient in terms of revenue collection. But there's also some areas of synergy with the, with the central government. And what we're trying to do is to use this um, revenue sharing formula as a way to institutionalize and strengthen some of those synergies. Things like um, trying to make sure you, you, you using technology, know who your workers are. You know, we're insisting that the same thing we did in the federal government you know, to drive efficiency should be done by every state. So when they need to collect money from the government, you make that a condition, and that's what we've been doing, and, they, and so far it's working. And then the second thing is to also look at, um, like you said, in trade and investment and industrialization um, initiatives that can, even where states can work together, frankly. So you're dealing with corridors and, 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 and um, southwest, you know, south, 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 east, north, east. You know, you know, so states don't have to always work as singular states. Sometimes they can work as regional blocks. The same question we addressed earlier about how do you achieve better regional integration. And I believe that ultimately, as if we address the problems we're addressing the way we're doing it, it will create sustainability because it will transfer a lot of the responsibility to the private sector and a lot of the growth. It's this idea of states trying to do too much, frankly, that leads to the um, lack of viability. And that needs to be addressed going forward. We are at time. I really wish we had more time because this is fascinating. Um, we would love to have you back um, down the line. I know there's a lot more questions. Uh, I have learned a tremendous amount. Um, I wish you uh, well with your meetings with the State Department and with others while you're in Washington. Uh, we do hope to see you um, more in Washington. And uh, on behalf of CSIS, uh, to all of you and to Nigeria, happy Valentine's Day. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.